Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so originally oh, this was going to be a Q&A with me, but we've expanded the scope. <laughs> and so I have some, uh, I have Angie here, who is a, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Angie's a, a co-committer on Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. We have Jess Mirbo, it's pronounced. <laughs> uh, Jess is working on the Views Initiative. Um, we have Shannon. Shannon is a project manager. She's been helping. She's been uh, helping to coordinate all of the Drupal 8 initiatives. We have John Albin. Uh, John is responsible for <laughs> responsible for the Drupal 8 uh, mobile initiative. Uh, we have Gabor all the way from Europe, um, uh, and Gabor, um, what's the time, Gabor? It's very yeah, early. It's 5.47. 5.47. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did I tell you that to be a core initiative lead, you need to have some, you know, real sense of commitment? Um, but Gabor works on the multilingual stuff in Drupal uh, 8. Um, we have Greg, uh, Greg Dunlap. <laughs> and um, Greg is uh, working on the configuration management stuff. And then we have you guys. <laughs> um, and we have uh, Chris, Chris uh, van der Water. It's actually a Dutch last name, so I need to like work on my mispronunciation. <laughs> so it, it's actually proper English. Uh, um, Chris is responsible for the uh, blocks initiative and also for the plugin stuff. Uh, and then last but not least, we have the almighty Larry Garfield, all the way from Chicago, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, and Larry is uh, responsible for, um, what was whiskey? And so that includes Symphony, but also uh, the web services things um, and stuff like that. Um, so what we were going to do is just basically not present anything, but just kind of open the floor for Q and A, and so we can you know answer your questions. Uh, before we do so, I'd just like to talk for like one minute. Um, I've al already presented sort of an update on the on the work that we're doing. Uh, I just wanted to sort of. Um, share my feelings a little bit, <laughs> um, and you know, overall, I feel very excited about Drupal 8. I, I think we've we've added some really amazing features, and and I truly truly believe that Drupal 8 will be a game changer for many for many reasons. I think we've added great new features for almost every target audience. Like we have some great new things for developers with Symphony and some of some of the architectural changes. We have some great things for site builders with views uh, in core and and some of the other things we've done. And we've uh, also added some really, really cool improvements for um, sort of end users, people that you know actually write content and manage content uh, in Drupal. Things with you know some of the Spark stuff and some of the uh, user experience improvements. So overall, I feel really good about all of the new features that we've added. At the same time, we have a lot of work left to be done. There's a lot of things that we've started that we need to um, you know, really polish, like some of the APIs, and we've definitely introduced some complexity that we need to, um, you know, try to remove or streamline so it's um, easier to to, uh, to develop for. So that that's kind of how I feel, and, you know, that happens to be in line with, I think, the phase that we're at in the development cycle. Um, you know, we're about to start the um, code, well, we're about to hit the feature freeze date, meaning we're going to switch to polish instead of adding new features. So we have, uh, a, you know, I would say we have at least six months or almost six months of, of polish time. Um, here's Mosh. <laughs> uh, um, uh, it's okay. I, I can, I can, I'm going to move the mic around. So that's all I was going to say anyway. So um, we're just going to do questions. Any questions? There has to be some questions. Yep. So uh, my question is about CS. Um, I think all Drupal 8 has been uh, reduced or improved. Obviously, mm -hmm. there are things that people want to get to and the ability to come in and do the things and the contact things and all those things. That's a good thing. I love it. It's a great goal. Um, I'm concerned that we are leaving behind other types of developers. Developers, junior level developers. 
<laughs> All right, it's a great question. Um, I could answer it, but like to offer the mic to anyone that wants to answer, or Mark even. Okay. I don't know, Larry. Do you have a Do you have an opinion? I think a lot of the yeah. things are. Larry sort of never has an to... opinion about anything. Never. Yeah, I have no opinion. <laughs> and I actually want to correct you on one thing, Dries. I'm actually in Miami at the moment at a different conference, um, so I'm kind of double dipping conferences at the moment. All right. Awesome. Um, did, exactly. did you hear the question? Yeah. Um, so I, I think, as Mark said, number of languages is not itself a metric of difficulty of learning. You know, Drupal is still a PHP framework, but <clears throat> in Drupal 7, um, we were using approaches and techniques and concepts that no one would be exposed to unless they're using Drupal. In Drupal 8, we are not entirely, but largely switching over to techniques and concepts and styles that people are more likely to have been exposed to. So someone fresh out of college is going to have an easier time understanding objects and um, you know, an observer pattern than they're going to understand a render API. No one is going to understand a render API who hasn't worked with it because there's nothing else like it out there. Whereas from a learnability perspective, a lot of the new stuff in the core system, in whiskey, in scotch, is mundane from a larger software standpoint. As if I, I heard Mark correctly, it's kind of, kind of hard in the back of the room. Um, you're saying it's, you know, it's not a question of oh, oh, it's harder than procedural as much as it is. Make sure that the stuff you're doing makes sense in context and is consistent and clean. And I think I see him nodding. I agree entirely. And a lot of what we're going to be doing over the next you know, four, five, six months is now that we've got all these new tools in place, let's flesh them out, take them to their logical conclusion, and you know, clean up a lot of the fact that we do have two systems inside each other right now. And cleaning that up is going to be a major task for the next couple of months. Um, but yeah, I, I think actually when we get right down to it, the learnability of Drupal 8 will be better than Drupal 7 especially if we documented correctly. Yeah, if if I could jump in on that for just a second, I think like, I, I don't know how much of digging through the code you've done thus far, but you know, in terms of the OO components that sit there, um, there's been a, a very high level of documentation going on in the vast majority of patches. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for me to open up a patch in a subsection that I know nothing about and not have any problems with just reading it these days. And a lot of that stuff is OO. And, you know, full disclosure, I wasn't doing PHP OO until like November of 2011. So, and that was writing the plugin system. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there are a lot of us, myself especially, who, is, who have come along um, and are doing OO for the first time here in Drupal 8. And um, I'm, I'm very happy with it. Uh, being primarily a procedural programmer before this. So, um, and if I could address annotations quickly, um, I'd encourage you to really give it a try before you ask me to remove it. <laughs> I also, that's another thing that's not too specific. Yeah. Um, I, a note about annotations. I think annotations uh, by themselves are a very defensible thing. I think they're, there can be a big DX win the way we're using them is crazy, though. And I think the, what you saw, I, I agree with what you saw. It almost looks like, I mean, it, when it starts to look like code. OK, annotations are, so and the concept of annotations is a way to add metadata to uh, classes or functions in PHP. It's a supported feature in languages like Java and a similar thing in Python. Um, PHP gets around it by using, like, if you see, like, the at param in, like, a doc block. It's basically custom at things, right? And you can say, like, like PHP unit uses these. 
And so you can have a, a method on a class that's like at test, and then PHP parses those, because parsing those is, parsing the doc block is actually a supported thing in the language. Um, so that's not too much of a hack, but then you have to look through that doc block, get all those and figure out which ones are annotations, and then apply that metadata. So it's like a way to, to add some sort of discoverability to your existing uh, classes and functions. Um, some people think, I mean, are really just of the opinion that like this is a total hack and we shouldn't do it because you're parsing comments. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Uh, PHP is an incredibly inflexible language. We need to take the expressiveness we can get. Um, but when it starts looking like code, I agree, that's crazy. And we need to maybe reevaluate how we're using them. Yeah, and just to like, to like throw out an official position on that, um, I'm not opposed to rethinking exactly how we're using them, but I am opposed to removing it. Uh, currently, it's basically just like anything you would have ever done in an info hook, but it's singular for a, an individual implementation, and it's sitting in a class. I will say that um, I think that there are definitely trade-offs in Drupal 8. I think that um, some things, that there are hopefully fewer Drupalisms, although we've introduced a few additional Drupalisms in Drupal 8, but we're hopefully moving in the direction of re reducing things that are specific to Drupal overall. Um, in the case of annotations specifically, and also for the DX in general, one thing that Drupal 8 is doing that's really positive is that um, we use our patterns consistently. N maybe we need to reduce the number of new patterns we've introduced or sort of streamline it, but when you learn something, you are learning it for all of core. When you look at an annotation um, on, a, on a view plugin, um, like if you, the, a view, if you have a views handler, the, the annotation there, you, can, you read that, you learn that pattern, and then you'll see that same pattern um, on, on an entity type. So the info hook for the entity type, the info hook for, for the view plugin is the same thing. It's there in the annotation. Um, and there's a lot of instances of that where we're, it may be that we're introducing new patterns that people have to learn, um, but at least they're used more consistently throughout the code base probably than in previous versions of Drupal. And like Mark pointed out, this is, I mean, we are just getting to the point where we're going to stop focusing on adding new features to core and instead we're really trying to improve the developer experience clean up performance, do refactoring, and, and so that if you, if that's a concern you have, um, you know, come in the core issue queue and, and try to help out with those issues because that's something we're gonna be starting to do, um, you know, within the next couple weeks, so. Uh, yeah, drupal.org slash community dash initiatives slash drupal dash core, um, that's for the core initiatives that has um, sort of bi-weekly updates and issues you can work on and stuff. So if you're concerned about that, check out the page. I'd like to quickly echo that as well. Um, this is probably, you know, a good time if you're interested in core development to like, you know, sort of start dabbling around with Drupal 8. Maybe if you have some contributed modules, it, I know it's early and things may change during the, um, you know, during the polish phase, if, if you will. But uh, we very much hope to get people to upgrade their modules and to give us feedback on what you like, what you don't like in terms of APIs. And there's, we will still make changes to our APIs at this stage. So it's, it's a good time to to give us that feedback and, and suggest alternative uh, approaches that are less complex or more in Any other questions? Jonathan? Um, so uh, I, I know we're, we're compiling uh, PHP and I'm putting that in the files directory. Um, and if, if you've got a if you've got a, a, a multi-head setup um, with, with lo lo lots of uh, uh, Apache servers, then you have to share your, your files directory. And if, if you're running PHP from an, an NFS share, um, is that going to be a, a performance problem? Um, it's a good question. Um, you probably don't have to have a, a shared file system. I, I, you know, Every head could have his own copy, probably. Um, that actually adds a little bit more overhead because you have to compile it for every, um, you know, web node. But I don't know. I think it depends on how it is used and how frequently it is invalidated. I don't mark your. <coughs> oh, for every okay. So yeah, gets. Uh, but you know, people don't enable modules all the time in production. <laughs> okay. So this is a question from Twitter. Are you worried about how fast major version releases affect the enterprise community? Uh, yeah, since they're the um, almost always the slowest to adopt. And that's, if you have questions, you can ask them via hashtag IOHackle. 
Nice work. <laughs> and that is a question from uh, Dominic Santangelo. I'd like to answer that question. Okay, go for I it. I think anybody who thinks the core release cycle is too fast is insane. <laughs> we have a three-year release cycle in modern, in modern development times. That's like a decade or 20 years. It's crazy. We need to be okay. releasing faster, not slower. It actually depends on who you talk to, in my opinion. So I, I kind of agree and I disagree. Like if you talk to the actual users of Drupal, um, some of them are afraid of three three year release cycles. They don't like to have those fast cycles. But then if you talk to developers, um, they definitely like short cycles because they want to use the latest and the greatest. So um, yes. nobody <laughs> has to upgrade either. Right. I so think part of the it, it's a tough it's a tough question. Part of the challenge here is that Drupal's release cycles break more than any other product. Um, and if you look at, you know, a Linux distribution or WordPress or Joomla or Symfony or Cake or Ruby on Rails, their version-to-version -version API breakage, even if they have it, is substantially less than ours, whereas we basically release a brand new platform um, every three years. We used to release a reasonable upgrade with some API breaks every couple of months. Then sometime around Drupal 6, well, first was Drupal 4.7 with Form API where we changed everything. And then after Drupal 6, Drupal 7 became a massive game-changing release. Drupal 8 is a massive game-changing release. Those take three years and break a lot of APIs. And we can argue whether those are necessary or not. I think they are. But we may want to ask the question, you know, do we... <laughs> Good question. <laughs> While we're waiting we for want him to, come to oh, wait, force okay. ourselves to break fewer APIs. Hotel so Wi-Fi. We have more frequent releases. Shoot. One of the nice things about a lot of the changes that are happening in Drupal 8 now mm -hmm. is because because we've decoupled so much stuff and we've made it so much more modular, it'll actually be a lot easier to make to make changes that are less invasive going forward from here um, and to do and to build backwards compatibility on top of it when we want to which is, I think is really important to having a faster release cycle because as Dries says a lot of people are scared of fast release cycles because because of the changes and the upgrades that they have to perform but um, but I, I still think I for a lot of reasons and not just for new developers, stuff like that. But I also think that in terms of our core community, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves in each release because we only release every three years. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure to get stuff done exactly right. And that's where a lot of our, um, that's where a lot of our conflict and the issues and stuff like that um, comes from as well. So it's not just, it doesn't, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of things in terms of our culture and how we work together and all that stuff that are influenced by release cycles. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really, really valid point because, I mean, there's an awful lot of conflict that I think wouldn't happen if we knew that in six months we could change it if we were wrong. Can I make a quick comment on that, too? Because it sounds like this person is worried about, like, enterprise community lagging behind when we have a release because it's too soon. And I think there's a lot of different stakeholders that are uh, impacted and interested in these releases. And you can't make everyone happy. That's number one. Like the Drupal shop owners want something that they can build off of for a few years and not have to completely retrain their entire team and do all this other stuff. Um, enterprise communities want something stable, but developers and end users, we want functionality and we want improvements and we want things to advance. So there's no way that you're going to satisfy everyone unless really the community makes an effort to make the upgrade path and the and the path to improvement a lot better. And that means Drupal ladders, that means documentation, that means people really getting more involved in the training aspect of things, which will make advancement a lot easier to do if we all can do it in a faster, more easier, less, oh my god, I have to relearn Drupal kind of way. So I think if, if this is going to be successful and we're going to have faster release cycles that don't piss everyone off and make it really, really hard we have to really focus on the training, development, and you know, moving forward into the next phase aspect of this community, which I think is sorely lacking. So that's my comment.
Right, and, and I've already started to look at some other companies, um, and I think there's a couple of interesting you know, ways to do it. I think the right time to have that conversation is when we're about to start the Drupal 9 development cycle. Uh, I just, I mean, I don't wanna like basically have that conversation now because we're, you have to be really focused on, on Drupal 8 in my opinion. But uh, all I, uh, what I do wanna say is that I'm open to making changes and I'd like to organize like a, you know, a, a big discussion <laughs> with all of the stakeholders um, and, and see what trade-offs trade we're willing to make. So, Mark? I think one thing we can do in the Drupal 8 cycle, and a big part of this is deprecating instead of breaking. And so if we're changing an API in Drupal 8, we say we may move uh, some procedural function or procedural functions functionality to a class, we can keep the function and have it pass through to the new API and mark it as deprecated. And so none of core should use it. We still have all the functionality there, but we don't immediately break contrib on day one. And I think the more we do that, the easier it will be to have major upgrades. Good point. All right, so let's see if there's some other questions because we can talk about this for an hour. And I just wanna make sure we were able to, to cover a few different things. Mori? So um, considering the, the volume of the, the changes that have been made or that's being made to Drupal 8, for example, using core, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to have it in core but considering the um, amount of translation that needs to be done, I'm quite concerned that um, the, the timing of string freeze, um, if we don't have it early enough, I mean, it's, it's difficult, but if you don't have it early enough, the chances are many languages wouldn't be ready for the, uh, for the stable, re you know, for the initial release. And I'm just wondering if there's any strategy or w workaround for that. All right, anyone has a good answer? <laughs> it, it, it pretends to be frozen. <laughs> that sounds like a question for Gabor. Uh, Gabor, did you hear the question? No, I didn't hear it. Can you summarize right. it? Short? So I'll try to summarize the question. Um, so Mori was asking, um, well, Mori expressed a concern about the, the timing of the string freeze and he's worried that there's not enough time for people to translate Drupal 8, specifically because we've added so many things to Drupal 8, like views, which is adding a lot of strings. And so um, he's worried about the timing of the, of the string freeze. And yeah, so, so I think there's, there's two things that, that help with that. Uh, first is uh, anytime there is a tagged release of Drupal 8, even if it's just like some kind of beta or alpha something, then it will be available on localized Drupal.org already right away. Uh, so it can be started to be translated. It's not necessarily frozen strings, but people can start translating stuff. And the second is um, localized Drupal.org is built to share translations between projects. So all the translations from views will automatically be applicable to Drupal 8, and people will not need to manually copy them over. So Whatever is already translated will be there right away, and it will speed up the process of translating the blade. Does it help? All right, other questions? Any Twitter questions? Trying to find a good one here. Yeah, one not written by Dave. He's <laughs> yeah, he's got a lot of good questions. How about this? Uh, what's one thing that you didn't get to do in D8 that you want to do in D9? And that's from Dave Hall. Interesting. Isn't Dave in the room? Oh, there is Who Dave. wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things um, that we aren't doing in Drupal 8 that I'd like to do in Drupal 9. Wow. To be honest, I haven't really thought about Drupal 9 yet. Um, but I feel like... Um, I mean, it, it, right now it looks like one, we won't be able to do all of the symphonification that we may have hoped to do, and that we may end up with a Drupal 8, which is mostly converted, 
but not fully converted. Um, similarly, uh, around the authoring experience stuff that we're doing, it, you know, I think we have a, a, a much bigger vision of things that we could do. Like, for example, one of the things which we, we've prototyped, designed and prototyped, actually is like a responsive layout builder. I'm not sure if you guys have seen that, but it effectively allowed people to build responsive layouts um, without having to be, a, you know, a designer, without having to write CSS. And I haven't seen anything like that in any other platform. And I think it would have been something that would allow us to leapfrog the competition. Uh, but it doesn't look like we will be able to get it done. And so, but just two examples. But I, th I think what it comes down to, I guess, is like it's a list of, of things versus like one big thing. I don't know if you guys have any... Yeah, to, to build on what Dries was just saying, the responsive layout builder is a big thing that I really wish we could have gotten into core. Um, but, you know, the, we have some interdependencies on different initiatives and the blocks and layouts initiative work that happens. And, and we just, I don't think we're going to have enough time to get it done. But I'm still very hopeful that it'll be part of Contrib um, because I do feel like uh, that would be really useful for um, people who are non-designers to build layouts um, there's also a possibility of, um, those are familiar with the responsive images problem. Um, we could make a solution that auto-configured responsive images as long as Drupal knows about the layouts and where the breakpoints are. All of that could be auto-configured. And responsive images are very difficult to configure right now. And the only way you could solve it is with a responsive layout builder. I'll be really quick because I know everyone has other important things to say. But one of my own personal wishes for Drupal 9 is actually more funding so that it's not just a like volunteer driven effort but people actually have time and resources to invest on a regular basis i think that that would really really revolutionize this entire release process because you wouldn't be you know basically saying please x person put your entire life on hold don't have a personal life so that you can do this bit um, because you're blocking 20 other things and that would be awesome I guess over the, the last um, year or so, we've seen some interesting crowdfunding models, especially for independent game development, things like Kickstarter. Um, the Drupal community, because it's so large and global, um, if someone had a Kickstarter campaign, for example, to put views in core, you know, how much money would have been raised? I mean, it's... I actually... I actually can address this. Uh, first of all, you can't, um, it's very difficult to do a project like that on Kickstarter. I did a lot of fundraising for my initiative and um, um, part, of, part of Kickstarter is that you actually have to deliver something and you have to do it in a specific time period. So it's not really appropriate for us to do stuff on Kickstarter and there's every possibility that our, that our thing would be canceled. Um, however, I will say that Fusing Core did put up a, um, a chip in, I mean, Jess can address this more, and they did raise some money. Uh, I did the same thing for CMI. Um, it was a very, very small fraction of what I needed, and in historically, um, those those crowdfunding efforts, while they may not have the inherent marketing that uh, Starter has, um, just because of their name, um, have all fallen vastly short. Um, and and historically, I mean, we that 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 has not been a very positive model for us from the funding perspective. I can talk more too about how Views and Core was funded, just briefly. Um, we put up a chip in, we raised um, about $13,000, which is an amazing sum of, sum of money. Um, uh, some part of that went to funding sprints and so forth. Um, some part of that went to fund part of my time. Um, but uh, the rest of what made Views possible, and uh, probably a, a much bigger chunk of the total amount of money, came from um, individual companies sponsoring developers. We have four people on the team, myself, Tim Plunkett, Damian Lee and Daniel Vayner. And um, the, the other three people, not me, work for Drupal Shops. I work for Drupal Shops out too, yay. Um, I, I start at Acquia next month. Anyway, um, th so, so Tim, Damian, and Daniel all had part of their time funded um, from the shop that they work for. And like a significant portion, we're talking like 40 to 50% of their time was contributed by that organization, which is amazing. That's um, ZivTech, New Digital Partnership, and Airdfish, by the way. So those guys made using Core possible. 
And then um, my time, so the first third of my time was funded by the Chippin. Um, Acquia funded the next two months, and then I have a third sponsor that I, they still haven't let me tell people who they are, but I do have a, a third large um, open source company that's sponsoring my time up through February 18th. Uh, so that, that model has worked very well for views. We were able to do a heck of a lot in a very short amount of time. And so it, I mean, it's definitely not possible for every shop that you have, there's like a certain minimum size to, to make such a huge financial commitment. But I think that committing a developer regularly is one of the biggest things any organization can do for, for funding initiatives. So. Yeah, if I, could, if I could hop in on that for just a second, I mean, like Commerce Guys donated a ridiculous amount of my time to to the um, Blocks Initiative. I mean, there have literally been weeks where I've had 40 hours a week um, to to work on it, uh, especially coming up to and shortly after um, like Munich and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I. But you know, this is this is the exact same sort of stuff that was happening in in views, like Jess was just talking about. And when when a company steps up and actually puts one of their developers out there to do it, you know, that's when when things really start happening. Unless you know you can go and you can fundraise like like Greg did. Um, if I could go back to the question that was originally asked for a second here, instead of jumping off on fundraising for a minute. Because um, that's more of a, a retrospective, like what would we do different going forward, sort of. Wait, question. before you start, before you start, can I pimp the mo the people who gave me money? Yeah, uh, totally. Um, this seems were, like the time to do that, right? There were there were six there were six companies that donated five thousand dollars or more to CMI. There were Acquia, um, Riot Games, uh, Dennis Publishing in the UK, Bluehost, Web Enabled, and Pantheon Systems. So. Please. I got to I got to work I got to work full time on CMI for seven months because of that, which was amazing. That is so freaking amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in uh, just to comment, just to tag on on what people said. You know, like I interview a lot of people, and there is a certain set of people that just come into the interview process and they say, "I'm interested in working for you, but I like to work this many hours a week on on Drupal." and you know, it may, it may be worth trying with some companies. I think some companies are actually very open to it if you, if you actually ask for it. And the right time to ask for it could be during the interview process, to be honest, because, well, um, so just a tip, I guess, for developers. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that most web development companies, most professional services companies, their employees have a little bit of bench time. Like, it's rare that you have 100% or more utilization in your company. And so what, what happens with the bench time? I don't know, but it's usually, you know, some companies give the bench time back to the community, so to speak. So uh, another thing that some companies do is actually add a little extra charge to their invoices. Um, and that extra money is used to e effectively have their developers con contribute back some of the things that they've developed for the customers and sometimes it's a line item on the invoice and if the customer doesn't want it it's taken off of you know of the of the proposal but often i think if you explain the values of open source if you explain the values of, of contributing back to the project um you know a lot of customers do get it so that's another way to make sure you have time to to, to give back so chris yeah, so um, I just wanted to hop on the uh, on the responsive layout builder train here for a moment. I mean, that's should be obviously my one big regret here. Um, we just we didn't have the bandwidth to get that far. Although I'm hoping to be able to demo here in the next two weeks that Sam and I have basically gotten to everything but that, which that in and of itself is a really huge topic. The everything that goes with really putting that layout builder in the right place and putting all the infrastructure around it to make it work appropriately from a user interface perspective. Um, but I think, you know, looking forward, uh, we have to figure out how to get uh, that in contrib um, as quickly as possible during the ADEX cycle nine, um, because we've worked very hard to get all of the underlying architecture to make something like that possible. Uh, 
layouts like uh, I mean in the previous session I talked about this but you know we got blocks in we got layouts in we've got displays in um, I'm hoping to have context and conditions in before um, eh, before next week is out um, so you know there's like all the groundwork is laid it's a matter of putting together a user interface that we can all agree on and I spent an awful lot of time during uh, during this cycle actually discussing user interface with a number of people, especially Boyan Summers. And uh, that's a really, really dense topic when it comes to what it is that uh, the Blocks and Layouts Initiative was trying to do. Uh, and there aren't any really fantastic answers sitting there, but when it comes to really like laying out the page and putting blocks in it, the concept of the, the layout builder, uh, the responsive layout builder is a really, really good one. And we, we need to chase that and get it available as quickly as possible. All right, so we'll take another question in a second, but let me quickly bounce back the question to you guys. I mean, you know, having looked at Drupal 8, is there anything that you guys think is, is really missing? Anything that comes to mind? Yeah? Um, the one thing that I'd really like to see um, in the next major release of Drupal and Drupal 9 um, that we always say we want to do and nothing has really had activity around it yet is some better tools for data migration into our core. Um, this would make upgrading easier um, since, since you know, the up upgrading a Drupal site often involves re-architecting anyway. Um, it would also allow people to migrate from other solutions to Drupal, things like that. That's something that I think that would be a really big win for Drupal. It's one of the things that people, you know, are concerned about most often when we do surveys about Drupal, so that's something I personally would, would like to see for nine. I'm uh, just going to say that um, I'd like to see better media management in Drupal 8 would be really good. Um, and in integrated as part of the content authoring would be a really great uh, addition to that to be able to manage all your images, videos, all that kind of stuff. The oh, what a surprise. Mark Sonnebaum has an opinion. Well, I was just going to say that uh, it would be nice to have PHP unit for unit tested, because surely, Greg, your classes are not actually unit tested, are they? Oh. <laughs> you, you probably need bootstrap.inc, common.inc. Those aren't unit tests. Come on. Mark and I were actually talking about whether or not we'd be able to do some of that in eight just a little bit ago, by the way. So, is can we? We should finish. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anyone else have a question over here? Just to add to the um, the layout, I guess if we'll take the smallest bit for basic website build, uh, views are already there and WYSIWYG is coming in, but I think... Yeah. <laughs> But I guess what's really missing just to complete this bundle is web forms. So I guess when we're going to have web forms inside the uh, Drupal, uh, then uh, I guess for a basic website, there's not going to be need for module extension from the beginning. So I guess it would make adoption of Drupal way faster than we saw adoption of Drupal 7. Um, I just wanted to ask, because I haven't kept up with what's happening in Spark and that I've been doing um, accessibility testing with Mike. What is happening with that, like uh, with Drupal I'm sorry, 8? can you talk into the microphone oh, more directly? <laughs> we can't hear you at all. Sorry. I'm um, just, um, I haven't kept up. I've been doing some accessibility testing, et cetera, but I haven't really kept up with what was happening on the Spark side. Is, is are we going to have inline editing in Drupal 8 or what's happening there? Just, just for a small update. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, Spark is an initiative uh, uh, to put a bunch of authoring experience improvements. Um, we started prototyping it in Drupal 7 um, just before Munich, and then af just after Munich, we started uh, putting those into core. Um, and so, yeah, we, uh, we managed to get uh, the responsive uh, toolbar. So in Drupal 7, when you look at your toolbar on an, on an iPhone and, uh, 
responsive theme, it takes up roughly like three quarters of your, you know, available screen size because it's just, you know, like this. The new toolbar is really great. Um, it can seamlessly switch back and forth between horizontal and vertical orientation based on the width of the screen. It also has icons, so when you scroll down to a small enough screen size, it just shows the icons and hides the text. Um, it's also, we worked with Everett Zufelt at the, uh, he was the former accessibility maintainer. He's an actual blind Drupal user uh, and a developer. We worked with him on it in, uh, at Drupal Camp Toronto in November, and he said that this, this toolbar was the single best implementation of an accessible, like, drawer-based toolbar that he had ever witnessed. So basically, from now on, when he is, people are asking him questions about how to make these types of things accessible, he's going to be like, download Drupal 8, because we got it figured out. And Jesse Beach has been an instrumental in getting that uh, whole stuff. That she, she basically, yeah. Yeah, I know, but she has about Spark in general. So, and then in-place editing is a second feature that we added. Um, that is also fully accessible. Um, it's keyboard accessible, and we added ARIA, um, you know, live region type of thing, so it'll explain where you are on the page relative, so it says editable, title, editable, this. Um, and it's, it's very, like, very svelte and streamlines and stuff like that. And, and I think people have a hard time with, with accessibility that sometimes, because they try and just make it so you, when you click in the page instantly, it's editable. But people get annoyed as hell by that, so we have a little flag at the top that's just toggle on or off edit mode, and so that's how we managed to make that accessible. So that's done. WYSIWYG is done. Um, we did a bunch of work just generally with the mobile and layout initiatives to try and push those forward. We didn't, unfortunately, get to the big responsive layout UI and the, the nice drag and drop blocks UI that we were hoping to get to. We had to kind of pivot there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to, we're really trying to push hard on uh, the authoring experience in Drupal because it's, it's a huge, it's, it's a place where, you know, like people will try Drupal for, you know, a second and say, this is awful, and then they'll leave, and then they'll go use WordPress or something that's really nice and easy to use right out of the box, and they'll use that for a couple of years till they hit some wall, because like, oh, I can't do this one thing, I guess I'll go back to Drupal now, and then, then they find Drupal again, and then they love it because they figure out it's so flexible and awesome. And you know, I'm kind of like, wouldn't it be great if people could just have that impression of Drupal right away? And so instead of having to leave Drupal and go do some other framework that's not as powerful, they just see it and they fall in love with the user interface as much as they fall in love with the code. And so that's what we're trying to do in Spark. Um, so yeah, that's the update. <laughs> Yep, so, um, yeah, that was great. Uh, so, you know, Acqui is obviously funding, like, all of us to work on this, and then we, the team has been very focused on Drupal 8, and so we let the Drupal 7 stuff just kind of, you know, because we had very limited time to try and get Drupal 8 in, in order, and so it was just kind of stagnant and, and hanging there. And Radio France actually um, approached us and said, you know, we love what you're doing with Spark. This authoring experience is really improved. We need it today. And so they actually funded a... Uh, Nod, uh, Theodore Biadala, who's the JavaScript maintainer and someone who's been involved in Spark for a long time. Um, and they funded him to actually crank on the inline editing and WYSIWYG capabilities in the Drupal 7 version. So now you can download the, uh, the inline editing and the WYSIWYG uh, functionality from Spark in Drupal 7, use it today, um, and it's just as good as the one in Drupal 8 and hopefully will continue to get better. And if you're interested in funding further development on Drupal 7, Dries posted a link to his contact form in his blog post. Apparently, he wants you to talk to him. So, yay. Thank you. Yeah. And can we hear it for Radio France? Great. Kim? I'll bring the mic. Thank you. Um, one of the really exciting things, I think, is all of the composer support, like basically pulling in all of these external libraries. And um, I'm just wondering if there's, um, how this is going to affect like contrib development. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of contrib modules that integrate with external APIs and libraries and, yeah, just how, um, how, how, how whether there's going to be support for hooking into that kind of global composer thing. And great question. I was stating that with Symfony and the composer stuff specifically, right, um, oh. in core. His question is, how is that going to affect uh, contributed module development, and how will we how will we deal with those things in Contrib? Is that a good how summary? Does the, how does Symfony Composer affect uh, module development? That's the question. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so it depends on the module, really. Um, for modules that dealt with the uh, core routing pipeline, 
to in some form. Um, that API has changed considerably, and you have more power than you used to. Uh, the API is very different, so that will be a non-trivial task. Non-trivial task to uh, for that module. However, you should be able to do it in a way that lets you vet and test your code a lot better, because <clears throat> um, because of the way things are broken up and because it's all done using injected OO, you should be able to do actual real unit tests on your modules now uh, for a lot of them, um, which is something that previously just physically wasn't possible to do. So that should actually help. For other parts of the system, say I maintain a, um, uh, a text f uh, filter module. Um, Symphony has pretty much no impact on that whatsoever. That API has been ported over to plugins, um, which is separate, and Chris is cheering that, and I am too, um, because you know Core used to have about eight or nine different ways that you could extend things and provide new implementations of things. And now with uh, plugins and core, once we're done converting things, there should be only one. So I, I think there will be, a, in a large sense, a, a large hump to get over for contrib modules. But once you get over that hump, the, uh, it should be a lot easier to learn the whole system than learn, have to learn each individual piece. Hey, Larry. Um, uh, yeah. I think I think Kim was actually asking a different question, which was like, will Composer have any effect on like, say, the way distributions are packaged, or is that oh. kind of more what you were, or pulling in external libraries that can be used with a module? So say the feeds yeah. okay. module could automatically grab Simple Pi or something like that. Okay, entirely different question. You're right. Right. Um, <laughs> I'll take the blame. So, com um, Composer, it's not going to have as big an impact as I wish it would, because at least as of today, we are not actually using Composer for core aside from a way to keep things updated easily. Um, there is a Drush plugin uh, for Composer that you can use now in Drupal 7 as well <clears throat> that lets you download um, additional libraries uh, through Drush. So if your module depends on a Drush library, I'm sorry, if your module depends on a third party library, you can specify that with a composer.json file and use this Drush command to download everything and, and set it up. Um, that works now in Drupal 7. I would really like it if we switched over to just saying, you know what, we're not going to put anything, any of these third-party libraries in the repository. Everything's going to be Composer. You want new um, libraries, fine. Modules are defined with Composer files. I don't know that that's going to happen. There is an open issue right now to use um, uh, composer.json files for module dependencies. Um, you've got about a week to get it in, I think. <laughs> um, so I'm not hopeful for that, which is unfortunate. Ten days. Ten. Excuse me, ten days. We've got ten days to get that in. So, um, yeah, I I don't really have hope for that at the moment. But if that's your thing and you can drive home in the next ten days, I will love you for it. That's a um, really good segue really to this question. Encourage. There's a, there's a question from uh, Kathy SCT. Um, yeah, it's probably our last question, but it's a really good one. What do you need during the next two weeks? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to pass the mic around we, here, too. Can we address that in just a second? Because I really wanted to tack on to what Larry was saying before we run down that last question rabbit trail. Um, okay, quickly. All right, 30 seconds. Uh, the plugin system was designed so that it could have been included via Composer, and we would still really much, very much like to see it done that way, uh, those of us who developed the plugin system. Uh, but that being said, uh, if you use a plugin-based approach, uh, we're working to get the annotated uh, discovery mechanism pushed up into the component portion that we want to see out in Composer. So ultimately, uh, if you use a plugin-based approach, it's at least a little bit more within grasp. I, I don't know that it's necessarily feasible yet, but I think the general point of what I'm trying to say is we're sort of moving that direction, whether it ever actually manifests or not is completely up for debate. To the previous question, I guess, which was, what do you need help with in the next 10 days? And I guess we go 
around quickly from initiative lead to initiative lead and maybe mention the one thing or the one, two things <laughs> that you need help with? Um, so we always need JavaScript yeah, developers um, to help um, improve the JavaScript that's in Drupal 8. Uh, additionally, we uh, need people to uh, clean up Drupal core's CSS uh, to make it leaner, uh, less use less specificity. Therefore, we're going to have smaller download sizes for all of the themes that we build for all of our client sites. Does someone else want to go while Jess looks at her queue? <laughs> Me? Oh, God. Uh, what do I need in the next two weeks? I need people to check back to the Drupal Initiatives D8 update page a lot and come to the sprint on Saturday, even if you're not in Sydney. Please, please, please join us. There's a lot of good to be done. So come, do stuff. We'll send you in the right direction. Just get involved. All right, so I, I just needed to check on the status of an issue because I've been here in Australia for like a week now and it's been wonderful and I haven't looked at Drupal.org at all. Um, so uh, <laughs> Views is in really good shape for feature freeze. Um, we have like one fairly small feature, but that would, would be good to s for a lot of, um, it, it, it useful. so the, the, our last feature here it, that we were going to try to get in is to add an HTTP response code area handler. So you could make a view return a 403 or a 404 or, or whatever, and right now it had one of the points of feedback we got was right now it has the list of every single response code possible, so you probably don't want I'm a teapot not in that list. Um, so that, but that, that's like uh, the, last, the last feature that's view specific. Um, there were a few things from other initiatives we were hoping happen, but most of our work now is gonna be integrating with core APIs, converting views, like I said. Um, the really big thing I would say to help with is we need help getting um, core and issue, core issue counts down to our issue thresholds because those block new features from being added. So we have we have 10 days left for our cute little feature for views that would be very useful I think for uh, for a lot of sites. Um, so right now there's uh, 19 critical bugs, 25 critical tasks, 108 major tasks, 104 major bugs. All of those things that are over 100 for the majors and 15 for the criticals block views from adding our last nice feature block any other feature from being added. So um, that's what I would ask everyone to help work on. I need people to come to the sprint tomorrow, which is Saturday and not Friday, and, and people who are you know, watching this remotely, um, help work on those issues. Do whatever you can to help us get those issues back down threshold so that our technical debt is reasonable to add these new features in. And, that, and that's across all of core. So Jess took mine. Please help us fix bugs. Um, I also, I haven't been in the Spark queue very much for the same reason. I've been enjoying myself not being on Drupal.org. But um, uh, Spark, we're currently uh, undergoing this uh, project to unify in-place editing, because right now we have like contextual links, we have local tasks, we have edit, you know, blah, 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 and it's kind of a mess. So we have uh, an issue, which I can get the URL and Well, I'll have it at the sprint tomorrow. Um, uh, an issue where we're trying to sort of uh, streamline all of that. So taking the overlay from taking over everything and instead only firing it on contextual links where it makes sense to have like the extra sort of background there, S minimizing the look of it so it's not so overwhelming, minimizing the form so when you click into contextual links to say I want to configure the block title, you only see the block title in the form and not the whole thing. Um, that's undergoing usability sort of it's, it's in a place with the usability team. It'd be great to have some people in there commenting on the usability, especially if you are like a content author or this kind of, or a site builder type of person. So we actually need help from non-technical people to kind of give opinions on this stuff because we're sort of at a deadlock in terms of like what we believe and what the UX team or p people from the UX team believe on that. Um, otherwise, Spark just generally needs help from uh, uh, JavaScript people, a lot of front end stuff, lots of stuff to do there. Um, helping out with Twig would actually be great. That's going to be a huge uh, component to helping front end developers. Um, you know, we can definitely find you stuff to do. Um, but we have a tag in the issue queue called Spark. So you just look at that list and sort it by uh, priority. That's that's our hit list. Uh, the REST team um, has one more feature that would be really nice to get in. Um, Right now, we depend on Drupal's usual authentication, the cookie-based authentication, uh, for your REST requests. And it would be nice to get uh, basic or digest authentication in um, so that uh, you could make a authentication request at the same time as the, your REST request. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we actually have a whole website for the initiative, drupal 8 multilingualorg and we have, a fo we have a focus issues tab on the site. You go there, and it lists visually all the issues that are need, need review or needs patch or are, are to be committed, et cetera. And those are the focus issues that we want to work on in the upcoming two weeks. And it's always up to date and live, so you can check that out and, and see very visually what we need help on. That's it. Chris? Um, so I am working very hard to get context plugins in, and I think that that's likely to happen tomorrow. My big uh, outstanding thing that just has to go in before the 18th is conditions. Um, and I've got the API pretty well in order, and I'm working to file uh, some user interface follow-ups to that. But if uh, people could just kind of hop in on the conditions stuff, uh, that's node 174. Three six eight six. Um, make sure I don't transpose those numbers. Uh, so yeah, uh, that would be. Hey Chris, um, if you could like message me the two issues um, for for the the context plugin one and the condition plugin one, I'll try to get people to look at them at the sprint tomorrow. Just send me a tell and I cannot hear you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you later. Uh, I will. Okay. I will help Great. Um, Greg, and then Larry. Um, I, I mean, for the next 10 days, I'm in pretty good shape for feature freeze. I think people should help Chris, Chris, <laughs> Gabor and Chris um, yeah. with their stuff because they, they have a lot more stuff for feature freeze than I do. But going forward, I'm going to need, after that, um, there's still a lot of conversion of Drupal core to happen to CMI. Uh, we just added a new um, multilingual metadata system to CMI, and we're going to have to add that all for core and write it all. So that I'm going to need a lot of help with that. Um, uh, and um, if you want to get involved in the issue queue, uh, the tag that we use for issues is configuration space system. Um, and of and you know if you're and if you're and if you're scared about getting involved with core, you should go to Jess's core mentoring hours twice a week because they're awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that beautiful segue. We're also holding um, a training tomorrow um, for to teach people who have never maybe never contributed to Drupal before how to get set up um, with the Drupal eight development environment, how to use the various tools the community has, like the issues and so forth. And concurrently with that, we're also holding a core mentoring sprint. So there's we have there's actually three separate things going on tomorrow in these in these two rooms. And this core mentoring sprint, what it is, is we we find current real tasks in the core queue, and it, we say, okay, this this critical issue here is 100 comments long, and the issue summary doesn't really describe what's going on. So what you can do is read that whole issue, take an hour or two, <laughs> read the whole issue do some research, understand the problem, and then write a good, clear issue summary. Um, things like writing tests for some of these bugs. So we can actually help you find something to work on and not just like say, oh, this is your job, go work on it, but there'll be mentors there who will help you through the process. Um, so yeah, if you want to get involved tomorrow, come here. Um, we, we'll meet for the core mentoring sprint meeting in this, this very room um, tomorrow, and then um, we'll be going over next door to the, the centennial room uh, for the larger sprint. Ah, uh, 9 a.m., thank you. Uh, and one, one quick thing to add on that, like one of the things we like to do is we like to commit patches from people that have never contributed to Core and like make it, you know, make it, make it a first tomorrow, so. Yeah, that's our, that's our favorite. Yes, it is our favorite. We'll, we'll commit your patches live on stage, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Larry, you have anything that you need to most help with? Yeah. Um, there's still a number of open issues uh, for Whiskey at this point. It's not all of them are features, but <clears throat> I think the two biggest feature-related pieces are um, the entity reference handling for the REST module, which I think is kind of critical. Um, and yeah, I said, you know, Lynn's got a pretty good layout of what the problem space there is and the kind of help she needs. It's not code help at the moment. It's um, design help, figure out, okay, what is the right way forward here? Um, and the other major 
uh, feature related piece is um, getting us to the point that we can be doing um, you know, partial page rendering and um, HTTP based caching. That's huge if we can pull it off um, and really, really disappointing if we can't because that's you know, a lot of what the plumbing we built is build, building towards that and it's in sight but still you know, so close and yet so far. So that's really a, a, a big area of focus. Um, once we pass the feature deadline, um, as Greg said, <clears throat> uh, there's still a lot of conversion work to do. Um, once we see where the dust settles and what the equivalent of a page callback is in the new model uh, between Whiskey and Sky, we're going to need an army of people to convert all of the old page callbacks to that new system. And we want to be able to get that done so we can take out the old routing system and um, you know, eliminate that duplication. So that's something that's going to need a lot of people working on it. And it's also a great way to get your uh, practice in for Drupal 8 uh, and for porting contrib modules to it. I, I like to offhandedly refer to this, to this as it's nearly time to port Drupal to Drupal 8. And that is phase one for making, you know, for getting yourself up to speed on the APIs and for uh, getting your, your contrib modules ready. Um, so that's that's going to be the next big step is trying to crowdsource that process of porting Drupal to Drupal 8 now that we've got all these uh, new systems in place. All right, thank you, Larry. So um, we're out of time, but as you can see, we need a lot of help. Don't be afraid to get involved. We can help you get involved. I, I promise you, you'll love it uh, most of the time. <laughs> um, but it's actually a very fun thing to do. So uh, before we wrap up, I'd, I'd like to um, give a big thank you and, and hopefully a round of applause for all of the people here up front because <laughs> they're, um, they're making huge sacrifices to make this happen. Like they're giving up nights, weekends, time away from friends and family and significant others to, to really build Drupal 8, which you know all of you, all of us, and, and many more benefit from. So if you're at the code sprint tomorrow, bring them some ice cream, milkshakes, whatever it takes to keep them going because the next 10 days are, are probably going to be a little crazy for, uh, for some of the people here. So, yeah, Pet a koala for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His name was Charlie. And then it's 10 p.m. Friday until 6 a.m. Saturday. <laughs> Do it! <laughs> Yeah, if you are in uh, New York City, it starts at 5 p.m. and goes until 1 a.m. Also, party on. Uh, so that's Friday. And then if you're in Chicago, 4 p.m. until midnight Friday. And then 3 p.m. Uh, in Denver, 2 p.m. in Los Angeles. You get the idea. So anyway, if you're in the uh, North American region, it's going to be Friday, not Saturday. So just be aware of the times. And please, if you're here, Go tell a friend to join, no matter where they are. Please. Thank you. Because you don't need to have registered for DrupalCon in order to participate in the Sprint. So bring as many friends as you have. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. If there's, there's not that much left, but <laughs> have fun. <laughs>